Hello, and welcome to another episode of Gossip Finance. I am your hostess, Alacia Singer. And I'm Duncan Sandlin. How's everybody today? How are you doing, Lace? I'm excellent. Uh, I hear you have something interesting queued up for us today, Duncan. Yeah, so we haven't talked about this, and it's it's been all the rage for a few years now. You know, we'll talk about wokeism. Wokeism. And oddly enough, this kind of circles into China, which is interesting and we'll kind of connect them together using financial knowledge <laughs> does that sound like a fun trip everybody <laughs> well it sounds like some kind of trip i have no <laughs> idea what kind of it is i i'm not connecting the idea of woke in china but we'll get there it, it, it all kind of loosely connects financially and it's kind of funny so anyway uh, all right for those of you who don't know i'll tell you kind of what wokeism isn't real well defined it's just sort of a thing that's in the ether it's basically conservatives whatever they're pissed at is woke that's basically the hell that is is code for but it does really? yeah pretty much but it really does it actually has um it does have an or an origin a little bit uh, but we'll get to that in a second but first i want you to understand um the issue with wokeism and here's fox news Little little segment from Fox News to help us. This is a virus. It's infectious. It destroys your brain. Almost every corner of our society is now sort of being infected. Scary with music, Lacey. You hear the scary music? <laughs> woke yeah. Music. It's coming for you. <laughs> Some of this wokeness. When woke infects something, it spreads its tentacles. We are seeing a woke ideology spread like a disease. The wokeness is very potent. This woke mindset virus the wokeness this is all we should be talking about <clears throat> californians are getting woke yeah i'm in a woke city here <laughs> shit <laughs> she like she was smelling shit when she said the, oh god the thing about the wokeness i don't know see i have this student who used to tell me this you're woke and and I might be too old to completely understand, but I knew it was a compliment. It was a compliment coming from this kid. It's but man, it's a compliment on Fox News. No, it's a different. It's different when the kids say it. When the kids say you're woke, it means you're not asleep. You're not stupid, <laughs> right? You're at least aware of what's going on, right? right? No, this is for them. This is more of a code word. But part of this goes back to um, they used to use cancel culture, and they still use that a little bit, right? That terminology. And that was kind of a ripoff of, uh, I can't remember, it wasn't called exactly cancel culture, but it had a similar name. But that was what we were talking about in, I think, a third wave feminism back in the 80s. And what they were talking about with that was, you'd be the woman at the meeting, right? But you'd be the one who is always silenced or interrupted or talked down to, right? You know, you could be the, you could be the, one of the most senior people at the table, right, as a woman. And in the 80s, this was true. This happened all the time. You'd be at the conference room, you'd come into the meeting, and instantly your subordinates who were men would all be like, oh, can you get me a cup of coffee? Or or, or speak to you like you simply don't understand. Right. Right. Mansplain. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, oh I, I don't do that well with mansplain. <laughs> But well, let me tell you why, though, Lacey. <laughs> oh, like... oh, God. <laughs> but no, it's. Um... But that's what it started as. And now they've sort of morphed it into this anything we don't like. And um, I didn't get a clip of this, but we'll move to some other ones. But uh, where this kind of started was. Um, I didn't really start there, but it was kind of the big one. It was Mr. Potato Head. I don't know if you remember this a few years ago. Is Mr. Potato Head woke? Yes. Okay. Yes, Mr. Potato Head. My kids see it. They're kind of telling me I'm enlightened, and I think that's totally a compliment. Well, like you're enlightened. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what it was was essentially it was a few professors. I think it was mainly one in Illinois, but they did a marketing testing for toys for Hasbro and Mattel. And I mean, mm -hmm. people don't understand professors, especially business professors and uh, science professors. Yeah, they make money teaching and they teach, but they make most of their money doing research 
for businesses, you know, they get paid a lot of money, think tanks, whatnot. That's where they make most of their money. They might make, you know, 80 or 90,000 teaching, but they'll make a quarter million or half a million dollars working for Hasbro for eight months on a project. Right. So these professors were doing that and they, I think they were working for Hasbro and Mattel. And what they were doing was trying to figure out because they were having a hard time marketing toys. Their sales were not going up. They weren't reflecting what they thought they should. And things like Potato Head were not, Mr. Potato Head were not selling as well as they used to, right? Even though that toy was a staple for Hasbro all through what, the 50s, 60s, 70s, right? 80s? Shit, I, I had one as a kid. I mean, do you ever have a Potato Head? Actually, I don't think so, mm. but my friends had Potato Heads and I did play with them. Yeah, they were fun. And what ended up happening was with the potato head was one of the ones where this was, this is kind of how this whole thing, I'm going to just guess how it went down in the boardroom, but this is kind of essentially what they, what they found, right? The professors found. So they'd have the kids come in play with the toys, but they wouldn't label them or tell the kids what the toys were. They just let a bunch of three to six or seven year olds come in and play for an hour or two. Right. And then they feed them. And then what they had at the universities where they had these little mock toy stores in like one of the classrooms they weren't using. And what they do is they tell the kids, okay, you can pick any two toys you want off the shelf and have them for free. Right. And so the parents would bring the kids to these studies because they get free toys and, you know, and so what the one thing they felt was odd was like potato head, for example, the girls would play with it a lot because it's a doll that you can dress up however you want, <laughs> right? You can change its eyes, its lips, its hat, its, you know, its accessories, right? Its ears. So the little girls would play with it, but then when they saw it on the shelf, they didn't want it. And when they asked him why, it's because it was Mr. Potato Head. And it had boys, pictures of boys on the box. So the girls thought, oh, this is a boy's toy. I don't want that. It's not for me. But when it was not labeled and right. didn't have any marketing associated with it at all. Girls liked it just as well as boys. In fact, we've even liked it. Yeah. Like maybe. So. Right. But that's the thing is, you know, that's what it was in the conference room where it was like, well, what do you mean they didn't want it when they saw it on the shelf? Because it says Mr. And then, well, Mr. Potato Head's for everybody. And it's like, well, but if you put boys on the box and you call it Mr., the girls think it's not for them. And then you know everybody at Hasbro went, fuck. <laughs> 50 <laughs> years we've been doing this. <laughs> I played with G.I. Joe with my two boy cousins, but I never asked anybody to buy me a G.I. Joe because when you walk down that aisle... That was all marketed to boys. It was all boy stuff. It was a, you know. That was the whole point. And there then wasn't the, G.I. Jane. There wasn't, like, there was no girl anything, no girls on the boxes, on the advertisements. So. Well, that was the thing. Is, is, yeah, with, with, like, with the boys, it's like they were like, if you don't tell them Barbies are girl toys, they'll get, they don't know that. Barbie's got a freaking Corvette. Ken's got a penthouse. You know, you, you you get the kids, you just give them a box of toys. Pretty soon, you know, Batman and, and Iron Man are hanging out with Ken at his penthouse. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, I'm not going to lie. You know what? When I was a kid, I grew up in a really tiny town. And in my age group, there were two boys and two girls conveniently, sometimes some mis miscellaneous farm kids or whatever in town. But we were the in-town kids. And... I remember that Barbie and Ken were definitely playing with the characters from WrestleMania really frequently. Yeah. I you, mean, they were a little short, but it basically worked itself out just fine. But once you take them out of the boys' aisle and the girls' aisle and out of the boxes, a lot of the packages, they're just toys to the kids. Right. It's whatever the kid wants it to be. So Potato Head said, okay, well, we're not calling it Mr. Potato Head anymore. We're just calling it Potato Head. But you can still buy Mr. and Mrs. Potato Head, right? But the brand is now just Potato Head because right. they want to make it more inclusive. And that was why it was so woke. 
And then they sell the box where it was a family pack, where it was two big potato heads and one one of the spud potato heads, one of the little potato heads. And and it came with like 42 different accessories. So you could make it two moms, two dads. You make it a son or a daughter. Make it whatever you want, whatever the kid wants it to be, whatever. Whatever combination and that right. you could think of. And because of that, well, also because of the outrage, people ran out and bought all the vintage Mr. Potato Heads before they were gone because they were angry about the wokeness. So so Hasbro made a killing on that. <laughs> okay, so can we safely say there are now um, conservative potato heads and liberal potato, potato heads? That's pretty much, yep. <laughs> pretty or much. Republican potato heads and Democrat potato yeah. heads. Pretty much. And on top oh, of that... And on top of that, there's sales to children. I'm going to say right now, if I see any potato heads with a MAGA hat, I am going to just die. I don't, don't know. Uh, I don't know. If I was Hasbro, I might make that. That's that's not a bad idea. You heard it here first, kids. We'll get I, one. I, okay. We'll if, get... if it already exists, leave it in the comments and let me know that <laughs> thing already exists. If not, when we see it come out, hey, we're going to know. MAGA hat. And pussy hat potato head. <laughs> oh my goodness. But they gotta be in the same set. Yes. <laughs> because then, then, you know, it's fair to everybody and, and it'll tick everybody off at the same time. That feels like a win to me. There you go. <laughs> All right, well, that's, so that's just sort of how that whole thing happened. Then, of course, it got into like M&M's and Dr. Seuss. So let's dive into, here's another Tucker, Tucker Carlson bit. I think this is him bitching about Dr. Seuss going woke. <laughs> I might be wrong. That might be the next one. <laughs> Just getting texts in the break from friends who live in Washington, D.C., where I spent 30 years. People being shot all over the city. Totally third world place. People living on the streets by the thousands. Do any members of Congress who are worried about QAnon notice this? Does Michael McCall notice this? What is happening to our capital city? They're allowing it to happen. Nothing's more infuriating than that. Except maybe what's happening to Dr. Seuss. Because if it could happen to Dr. Seuss, it might happen to you. Dr. Seuss went from being a beloved childhood author to worse than Hitler in just a matter of days. On eBay, you are allowed to shop for copies of Mein Kampf. You can buy all the racist filth you want if it's about white fragility and Robin D'Angelo wrote it. But a number of Dr. Seuss books have been purged for, quote, offensive imagery. A spokesman from eBay put it this way, quote, eBay is currently sweeping our marketplace to remove these items. So now you're not even allowed to buy a used copy of Dr. Seuss's books. It's just too dangerous. Matt Walsh is the host of the Matt Walsh Show. He joins us tonight to explain what this is. <laughs> okay. Before we get into Matt Walsh, the ultimate racist, <laughs> anti-trans, women belong in the home guy. <laughs> Dr. Seuss. Why is Dr. Seuss gone so... Why is he compared to Hitler? He's not actually... What people forget is a lot of Dr. Seuss books, because he was a cartoonist during World War II. He did a lot of propaganda stuff for the U.S., but he did a lot of racist shit. So like um, some of his books, like to so the Chinese characters have giant buck teeth and this raw, the circular hats, right? The pointed cone shaped hats and, and they're not real bright. Right. Um, the, some of the black characters are very much the, uh, the old, what were the, what was it? The, like you used to see in the thirties and forties where they had the black faces and the white lips and the big lip, white lips and all that shit. So it, it, it was pretty bad. So the thing is, is this, is a lot of Dr. Seuss books aren't like that. And a lot of parents buy Dr. Seuss books for their kids, right? But what happens is, is you go on as a parent, you buy the Dr. Seuss book, you get it home, you start reading it to your kid and you're like, oh shit. <laughs> this is yeah. really 1950s, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. I, I mean, I don't have any children. Let me, and I, I'm a teacher, but I teach high school. So this is not likely to be me, but I could see myself just thinking, oh, green eggs and ham was my favorite when I was a kid and just like ordering some random Dr. Seuss stuff and then opening up it and being like, oh, wait, oh, yeah. Huh. What do I do with this? I, I could see being very caught unaware because in, in our generation, you know, it was just stuff that was purchased for us. Um, 
maybe there were some super aware parents, but I don't think that that was sort of the conversation people were having or what they were thinking about. So it was just what no, was put in front of us. But when we were kids, it, there wasn't, they didn't have the full, I mean, it, it was hard to get like the full sets of all of his works, right? It, I think Green Eggs and Ham was literally the only one I owned because you just like bought individual ones. Yeah, we got like, I had like Cat in a Hat and Green Eggs and Ham um, and a few others. But yeah, no, none of it, ones that we had, had any of that crap in it. What ended up happening was, I mean, they're going to talk about how it's all wokeness. Once again, this is not a woke issue. This is a financial issue, right? Just like uh, Hasbro Potato Head. It's a financial issue. The company, or the not the company, but the the people that own the Dr. Seuss estate, right? His, you know, his what, grandchildren or whatever it is now, they basically figured out, hey, our sales have been going down. And part of it's because people buy these and then they think, oh, shit, the rest of it's like this. And so now we're getting bad press and bad rap. So we're just going to table some of this stuff. And eBay said, well, yeah, we'll just table some of this stuff too. Nobody here is upset about this. Nobody, Dr. Seuss, no, none of them. They're saying, basically, we want to up our sales. And this is hurting us because we're not being inclusive of the larger group, right, of Americans. That's all it is. Just like Mr. Potato Head, we're going to take the Mr. away so we can target girls because that's, that's half our market right there that should be buying these and they don't want them. It says Mr. on the box. Right. You know, there's hundreds of thousands, you know, millions of children that should be reading Dr. Seuss, but they're not buying it because mom saw, you know, a racist African-American figure in one of the books and won't let me read that anymore. <laughs> right? Good job, mom. Right. So that's all this is. But they're going to try and make it into a bigger issue because... They've got nothing else. They're just, they're trying to make it into a political thing, but it's not. It's a financial. Matt, thanks so much for coming on. I, I can't believe A, I'm defending Dr. Susan B. I think it's the big deal that I think it is, but I don't think I've seen a more depressing story, I don't know when, than eBay is making it impossible to buy used copies of Dr. Seuss books. Like, what, what does this portend? Seriously. Yeah, that's the thing. It's not, it's not just about Dr. Seuss. By the way, I thought that if the left was ever going to come after Dr. Seuss, it'd be, it'd be for like, promoting elder abuse with hop on pop or something like that, but they chose an even more, <laughs> an even more absurd reason. And it, but it's not just Dr. Seuss. The point is we have these major corporations that now have the ability and are exercising that ability to shut down speech that they find offensive. Um, and, and it, okay. <laughs> so that's all it was. That's all I wanted him to say. They think it's a free speech. Basically to, to shut down racism. No, no, they're saying it's a free speech issue. Okay, what they don't understand is corporations, free speech laws don't necessarily apply to them in that way. They're not the government. The government can't inhibit your speech, a certain speech, right? But a corporation can say, I don't want to produce this content. Well, let's also be, be honest. Like, <laughs> you suspend many of your rights when you walk into schools and workplaces mm -hmm. because you suddenly have to adhere to whatever their policies and protocols are and you can't just say anything right there are lots of things i cannot say in my workplace mm -hmm. that i'm thinking in my head all right right i can't just say it and i theoretically have free speech right but i can't say any of that there you know so we suspend those things and people people forget that you agree to suspend those things when you go into certain establishments. Right. No, I can't run and around. Let's I, talk let's we'll talk about our our favorite our favorite network, <laughs> the Ramsey Network. Yeah. Um they are a very, very, very Christian leaning network. Mm -hmm. They to the extent to where, you know, like Part of their hiring process, you know, especially for their personalities, is like the person and their spouse having dinner with Ramsey and his wife and whatever, and they have to like submit their budget and like all of this sort, all of this well, sort of stuff. Which that's illegal. I think I, I, I think that's that's illegal. Way, what they're doing. 
That's um, illegal hiring practice. It's different. So like, oh, that's totally illegal. But the point being, <clears throat> they get to choose not to accept, you know, callers that are of certain leanings, mm -hmm. not to deal with issues that are certain leanings. Mm -hmm. I mean, they've extended it so far, even into their hiring practices, and nobody's even sneezing at them about it. But like, Man. suddenly mm -hmm. eBay doesn't want to put a bunch of books out there that are known for having outdated content that falls into racist categories but it's and not, it's, somehow it's not eBay. It's the owners yeah. of the Dr. Seuss estate. Mm. They are bullshitting you on that. It's not eBay. The other thing about it is is this. So this is the whole thing on the right is politically this they think this works for right wing candidates. For promoting is that oh yeah they're coming Wait. after what the, the what works specifically what strategy this this bitching about woke stuff they're coming after your free right. speech this wokeism that they're they're changing basically that's what it always is is they're changing the world it's the same stuff it's 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 you're not allowed to say this anymore you can go back through history the history of mankind there's been thousands and thousands of movements of well, they just won't let us say this anymore. There was a whole movement back in the, what was it, in the 18, whatever it was, 70s or eight after the Civil War, where they were like, well, you can't compare Lincoln to an ape anymore. And that's not fair, because Lincoln's head looked like an ape, so there was a big... I was like, was there a thing about comparing yeah. Lincoln to an ape? Yeah, when he ran for, I, yeah, his opponent, his, when, he I, ran, when he ran for election, his opponent did that, because he does. His, he had a big head that looked like it did look like a little bit like an ape. Oh. But they would used to oh. put a picture of him next to an ape just to show it, right? And they're like, well, you can't say that anymore without people getting upset or offended. And there's, they're, they're, you know, they're canceling our speech and shit like that. It's the same shit, recycled shit over and over and over again. But they do it because they think it works politically to help them out. And that's what they're doing again. What they're not, what we're trying to point out is these are all all these corporate things, this the corporate wokeism shit that they're bitching about, these are all financial decisions. Corporations are not sitting there going, hmm, how could we be more socially conscious? What's happening is they're going, hey, we're losing money because we're not more socially conscious. <laughs> so maybe we need to start being more socially conscious. Or hey, we're driving away a lot of customers because of this shit maybe we should stop doing that that's it that's all that's happening here do you really think corporations are sitting there in a boardroom going what's the best thing for humanity no oh hell no <laughs> if they're publicly traded they're thinking all right what's going to sell more shares if they're not they're thinking all right what's going to turn more profit Profit either way, they're, they're still thinking basically the same thing. Well, it's, a, it's the same thing we do with our clients, right? When it's us with our clients and we have our financial hats on, it's not what's the best thing for humanity. It's what's the best thing I can do for my client. Right. So I can get paid, right? If my client wants to invest in guns and cigarettes and, you know, you know, you can vote for whoever they want, blah, blah, blah. I, I don't sit there and bitch about it. I don't complain. It's their, it's their money. It's their issue. But that's what you do. I mean, it's not a, that's the thing is, it's like, but when I'm out of that and we're on this show, we can talk about these things and go, well, yeah, the good thing about this is, is society has gotten more and more progressive. The long arc of history leans heavily to the left and it goes back and forward, but it leans heavily to the left. But the bottom line is these corporations are not responding to the politics of the right. They're responding to the politics of the left because that's where most of the people are. That's where the consumers are. That's where the money is. And if you're an executive, you follow the money. Even though a lot of these corporate executives are very conservatives, very conservative people, they will do whatever it takes to get the female consumer, the black consumer, the Hispanic consumer, the Asian consumer, the gay consumer, right? We want them yeah, all. I, I literally 
just uh, did a free survey. Um, I'm, I'm a part of an uh, LGBTQ, et cetera, et cetera, um, sort of survey group. I get these surveys randomly. And I usually don't have the time to stop and do them, but I decided to do this one. And it really was all about largely but travel and logos right. that would appeal to the broader community, mm-hmm. you know, if they want to market right. to anybody in the LGBTQ community. And I was like, I'm helping you with your logo. Come on now. <laughs> I did have opinions about it though. There were some I didn't like, so, you know, I did offer that opinion, but yeah, I mean, well, it's all, uh, yeah. Well, when, yeah. When we started our little tech company, uh, we were going, we, we, you know, we picked out a mascot, but we were trying to figure out what we wanted the logo look at. And one of the logos somebody submitted, we got it. And it was, we were looking at it and um, my business partner was like, that looks familiar. And I'm like, dude, that looks like the ISIS flag. I don't think we're going to be using that one. <laughs> it's too close. <laughs> that's a bad damn day right there. <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's a swing and a miss on the artist part. <laughs> We do not want to be associated with that group. <laughs> All right. Well, the woke thing has gotten so bad that it's it's transferred over to think tanks in the right wing. And here's a guy. Um, I think his name is Fitzpatrick, something Fitzpatrick. And he's got a whole new tool to combat woke. Are you ready? How woke corporate America has become. The 1792 exchange setting the policies and practices of more than a thousand companies, ranking the likelihood of the management taking action if employees have a different point of view. 50% of companies were rated low risk, meaning little chance of them prioritizing ideology, but 30% were found medium risk, and even more alarming, 12% were rated high risk. Joining us now. <laughs> So, just to, just to help y'all out here, this is the uh, woke o meter. <laughs> How do they determine that this these companies are high risk or low risk? We don't know. We'll never know. But they determined it. <laughs> so let's see what he says. Was the president of the seventeen ninety two exchange? Paul Fitzpatrick, Paul, welcome. Go. What a great service you're doing to America by ranking these. <laughs> what a great service. Is power. We can get to know what they're really? up to. Uh, explain ESG, envir- environmental and social government governance, and how that impacts how these companies are acting. Rachel, good morning. Thanks for having me on. ESG is a set of principles that are ill-defined, which is really the answer. Environmental, <laughs> social, and governance principles that activists can use to fill and weaponize corporations. They can cancel customers, as we've heard, and you talked about, can deny service. They can choke off funding based on these principles, and they're rating companies based on whatever the... Okay, so essentially, let me get out of that. He's just making shit up. They've just made up a submetric that we're going to measure and we're going to say these companies are woke. And it really comes... For being woke. Right. But when he's doing that, what they're really doing is they're saying this. These companies, because his uh, 1792, whatever it is, group he works for. He also works for ALEC. Do you know who ALEC is? A-L-E-C. ALEC writes, so they do these... uh, one of their big things they do these draft bills right for state legislatures and then they send them to the conservative state legislatures there and so these guys all they have to do is fill in the name of the state and then sign it and submit the bill so they do a lot of anti-abortion legislation a lot of anti-trans legislation a lot of pro-gun legislation so basically when he said this it, they're the woke thing. He said anybody who doesn't align with right wing evangelical Christian principles, because that's what that group is. So the question is how many companies align with our principles versus don't align? That's all it is. So the woke o meter. <laughs> 
I mean, it sounds like it's something that should be at a freaking state fair. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm thinking it about it from, you know, the angle of somebody who would be out on the job market. I might enjoy a Woken Leader to help me choose my employer because I might want somebody who's more at risk for being woke as opposed to less. Some other people might be looking for the opposite, but well, the it might not be the world's worst thing for somebody shopping for a job. But the problem is, is what do we mean by woke? Nobody ever really, on the right, they never really say what they mean by that. It's just all the stuff they don't like. It's right? just stuff we don't like. It could be anything. Woke, woke could be anything. It could change tomorrow. In, in my particular area of liberal camp, I really just think of it as like a synonym for enlightened. But but people have definitely different ideas about what constitutes enlightened versus not, right? So even having a synonym for it doesn't yeah, really set particular criteria. Yeah. It's like um, it's like the word domo in Japanese. If it, you can kind of apply it to just about anything. It's just sort of a huh, yeah, kind of word. <laughs> I do like a good thinking word, domo, huh? Well, I mean, it's it's kind of just like saying uh, hmm. <laughs> it's <laughs> really eh. Nah. Eh. It has a lot of different meanings, you know. You could also use it to emphasize things. It's like that's my point. Is it doesn't doesn't really mean anything. I think that the literal translation for Domo is just in every way. Mm. So it can kind okay. of be, you can apply it to anything, right? <laughs> so, anyways, so that's what, that's the big thing on the right is they got the big woke battle, right? And that's part of the anti-trans thing and the abortion stuff, and blah, blah, blah. But here's where it starts to lead itself into more of a bigger sort of political issue, which I think is interesting that we're going to jump into. And this involves China. We had a, sorry, we had a little technical issue there, everybody, but we're back. So um, we were talking about China and how the wokeness thing kind of bleeds into it. And I'll get into that in a second. It seems roundabout, but it's actually kind of a straight line. But I want to do this clip here. So this is the majority report, and this is uh, Emma Vigilant, and she's doing a, a clip of Nikki Haley who's running for president, who's, I think she's the government of South Carolina. Um, anyway, Nikki Haley has kind of stepped in this week, but she says some stupid stuff, but we're going to listen to it and we're going to go over it real quick because she kind of gives away a little bit of the game here. And a lot of them just don't really seem to have coherent definitions for what it actually is. But Nikki Haley is convinced that wokeness is the number one threat that we are facing right now. <laughs> and, and this is a big issue in the Republican primary as well, woke and wokeness uh, and what that means for families around the country. You're quoted as saying wokeness is a virus more dangerous than any pandemic, hands down. So for those families who look, look at you saying that and say, I don't know if wokeness, you know, this pandemic took my family member. Um, what do you say to them? Well, I have friends and um, family members. My sister-in-law died from COVID. So look, it's there's no one closer to it than, than our family. And we share that grief with all the other families. And that's the reason why I think we need to hold China accountable for exactly what they did to many families. But when you talk about wokeness. And that's where it is. So skirting off my sister-in-law died. <laughs> that's not important. What's important here is wokeness is a virus. Worse than any pandemic. Even the one that killed over a million Americans, including my sister-in-law. She was a bitch anyway. We didn't... <laughs> I mean, that's kind of what she did, man. Jesus. <laughs> so. Wow. But see, you notice how she jumps from wokeness directly to China. So this goes back to a lot of things. So this goes back to the the anti-communism crap in the 50s, the yeah, conservatives, red scare crap. The, the red scare stuff. Then it goes forward and, you know, it, it, China is a big country. They're the second biggest economy next to us. And they do compete with us economically and they are competing with us economically. And we'll get into some of that uh, in, a, in a minute here because it's going to affect currencies and things like that going forward. But the interesting thing is they're moving, this is the Republican primary for the president. This is the big issue, wokeness in China. These are the two big things. And if you forget, what happened was is 
Trump, when he started his presidency, had this whole thing about China's lying to us, they're cheating us, they're taking our jobs. Right, he used to say it, China. 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 So China was taking our jobs. Remember, he started a trade war with China that ended up mm-hmm. jacking up tariffs, part of what caused the surplus problem during the pandemic. Um, and I want to show you, this is part of what started that, <laughs> kind of how it started, is one, there, there are a lot of people on the right who are very hawkish against China, like they want to go to some sort of war with China, which would be stupid, and which probably is never going to happen. But I want to go back. This is an older clip from last week tonight. And since HBO has never sued us yet, we're going to steal another one until they say something. I'm pretty sure John Oliver wouldn't care. But if they send us a cease and desist, we will. We will. We will. We'll just call John Oliver and apologize. Um, but I want to show you this. Cause... So maybe, maybe he'll want to join us. <laughs> yeah, maybe. If any of you know John Oliver and he wants yeah, to come on yeah, the show. Yeah, he can come on the show anytime he wants. <laughs> Email address is linked below. Okay. We'll send him a gift basket even. So this is kind of how the whole trade war started with China. And it is way stupider than you think. So it's this guy, Peter Navarro. I he, already think it's going to be real stupid. So Oh, it's it's, it's it's super stupid. So Peter Navarro here. This is the, the trade guy for Trump the author of a series of get rich investment books and like trump he's obsessed with trade deficits in general and china in particular saying trade with china is a zero-sum game meaning one country can only win if the other country loses and it is hard to overstate just how rare his views are among economists when the new yorker profiled him they asked navarro to help them find even one colleague who agreed with him he gave them two names one was peter marisi a University of Maryland professor who said of Navarro, he has a rather severe position, that zero-sum statement, I have a problem with that, (laughs) where's his proof? (laughs) And the other was a blogger named Alan Tonelson, who Navarro described as a fine economist, to which Tonelson replied, I do not hold an economics degree. (laughs) And and I'm guessing Tonelson also doesn't hold a degree in web design because this is the photo on the about page (laughs) of his blog. So... If you are understandably wondering at this point, then how on earth did Navarro get a job at the fucking White House? Well, it is way dumber than you are thinking. Apparently, Jared Kushner was tasked with finding Trump experts on Chinese trade. And this is how he went about it. So Jared went on Amazon. He fired up his computer and he found some of Peter Navarro's books and he asked him to come to the White House. That's how Peter Navarro ended up in the White House. Yep. Jared looked for experts on Amazon. That was his rigorous process. So when Jeff Sessions does get fired, be prepared for him to be replaced by Crystal Caswell, author of the erotic fiction novel Dangerous Rock, a dangerous noise novel. (laughs) Because for whatever reason, that is honestly the first thing that came up when we typed good law person, parentheses, smart, into Amazon. (laughs) So that was oh, how, your fight is so much stupider than I even thought. That's not good. Oh, jeez. But Navarro's biggest thing is, once again, he's very hawkish on China. He thinks that we have to go to some sort of economic war with China. His big thing, too, is he did like a documentary, and they're going to show you a clip from it because it's freaking stupid as hell. But this is what starts this. But it's, once again, stoking up all the anti-communist and it's a lot of the, you know, anti-Asian, you know, racism from the past. But that started early in Trump's presidency. And that worked for a lot of conservatives. They liked that. But here was Navarro's uh, clips from his documentary. I'll show you in a second. Now, Now, the Navarro book that Jared found was called Death by China. And it paints the U.S.-Chinese trade relationship in apocalyptic terms, because while there are some legitimate complaints about China's unfair practices, they've uh, deliberately depressed their currency, they violate intellectual property rights and arguably skirt WTO rules, this book goes way further, with chapter titles featuring phrases like Shanghaiing the gene pool and Look, Ma, there's a Death Star pointing at Chicago. Navarro actually turned the book into a movie that one critic called the documentary equivalent of a raving street corner derelict, which (laughs) seems harsh until you see how the movie begins. 
The film you're about to see addresses one of the most urgent problems facing America. It's increasingly destructive trade relationship. <laughs> It starts like that. <laughs> its warm-up is a literal knife being stabbed into the heart of America. And if you're worried that that leaves it with nowhere to go, please don't be concerned, because there are even less subtle animations to come, which depict China's trade practices as guns and bombs that blow up American factories, and stunningly deceptive moments like this. China has stolen thousands of our factories and millions of our jobs. Multinational corporation profits are soaring. And we now owe over three trillion dollars to the world's largest. <laughs> okay, so this is all anti-China propaganda crap, right? So, first off, trade deficits are not they're not a government deficit. It just means that our companies bought more than we sold to that country. That's all it is. It's not like it's sitting in some bank somewhere. Right? It's not like the Chinese have some Scrooge McDuck money pit titled Dumb Americans Money. <laughs> it's not it's not what's going on. But but it see that, but that's how all this starts. So now you have a lot of the anti Chinese sentiment, the wokeism stuff coming from the other side, and then the pandemic hits. And where's the pandemic start in Wuhan, China? China. China. And so now it's kind of all this gets blended. And then what happens is you run into the Twitter hearings and the TikTok hearings recently, right? Because TikTok's owned by China. And what are all the Republicans pissed about? You're being, these companies are being woke and censoring our speech and all this stuff. When what they're censoring is you're saying things that are untrue about the pandemic that are getting people killed. So now they've blended the two together. So these two lines came and crossed at this point during the pandemic. And then you had a lot of that anti-Chinese sentiment. You had what Asian hate crimes spiked during the pandemic. And they're still up because people blame the Chinese for the pandemic. And there's still a lot of conspiracies that they, they started it on purpose as a bioweapon or something, which is all nuts. But anyway, but this is the thing. So they did the TikTok hearings recently. We'll, we'll go through that real quick. But this is kind of what it is. It's basically just bullshit to blame China. It's jingoistic crap. And you're going to see some of it right here. And I think this is the majority report again, but we're going to just watch this clip. Really hoping we could get that done. And I'm really uh, excited about hearing that from folks. The other thing is that TikTok needs to be an American company with American values and end its ties to the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, this is something that will be critical as we look and go forward. And then three, we all agree we have to protect our kids. The committee should consider banning the use for children under 13 of not just TikTok, but all social media platforms, or at least empower parents. Uh, in addition, have rules of the road for teens that are 13 to 17 so that families can do what's right for their families. So for privacy, that's on us. Internet privacy is on us. As far as uh, being an American company, M Mr. Chu, you, as you know, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States at the Department of Treasury uh, reviews foreign investment that affects national security. Right now, they've negotiated with your company about this Oracle setup that you've talked about, servers in an American company in America and Texas, and then Oracle would monitor the algorithms. But pressure is mounting. So, Mr. Chu, would TikTok be prepared to divest from ByteDance and uh, Chinese Communist Party ties if the Department of Treasury instructed you all to do so? Uh, Congressman, I said in my opening statement, I think we are need to address the problem of privacy. I agree with you. I don't think ownership is the issue here. With a lot of respect, American social companies don't have a good track record with data privacy and user security. I mean, look at Facebook and Cambridge Analytica, just one example. So, so uh, I, I do think that you know it is not about the ownership. It is a lot about making sure we have Project Texas, making sure that we're protecting and firewalling U.S. user data from unwanted foreign access, giving third parties to come in to have a look at this, and making sure that everybody is comfortable. We're giving transparency and third party monitoring. And that's what we're doing for Project Texas. Well, 
So, okay, I just have a lot of thoughts about this. Um, the United States certainly does not have a good history. So with- we're going to just listen to them for a second, but but this is where it all kind of boils together. Data privacy. Um, I'm old enough to remember the Edward Snowden revelations um, and the documents showing essentially how the U.S. like was able to open the door into data privacy in places like you know Google um, and get people's data uh, in mass with like a dragnet. And we know that these companies have nearly like incredibly close, I don't want to say symbiotic, but very close relationships with our governments um, in both the form of like, say, campaign contributions, lobbying, um, and like literal federal contracts. And I would not be shocked if Meta's extensive lobbying efforts, extensive campaign contributions, both in the form of dark money and what we have publicly, which trends a little bit more democratic, but we know that these companies like the crypto guys bragging that he does it behind the scenes to Republicans. So that's probably the case with a lot of these companies like that, that they had a heavy influence over the tenor of the, that hearing yesterday, because Meta owns Instagram. That is the number one competitor to TikTok right now. So that's, she hits the nail on the head right there. This whole thing at the end of the day, come on. They're trying to make it into this woke thing. No, TikTok needs to have American values. By American values, he means evangelical conservative values. I mean, he's being pretty clear. He's making it a political issue in that sense. She makes it a point. No, this is a financial issue that politics is bled into. Because a lot of people campaign on social media. And that's where they get a lot of votes. And there's a lot of money flowing through. And Meta, which owns Facebook, which was Facebook, right, owns Instagram. And they have a lot of conservative contributors. And conservatives use Facebook a lot to campaign. And do a lot more successfully than uh, liberals do. Um, So this is not, it's a political issue for them, the Republicans, right, in a sense. But it's also... Uh, a financial issue for the corporations because Meta really doesn't give a shit who wins the election as long as it's good for Meta. Do you think they really care about abortion rights? Do you think they really care about whether or not we get social security or child tax credits or any? No, they don't care. They're playing a game. And a lot of this is, is, well, we're going to scare the fact that TikTok is also in line with China. So therefore, they must be anti-American. And this is sort of the game that's being played. So yeah, so anyway, that's just, that's kind of where this comes into play. Now, the new big scare in finance, and we're going to join the the Ramsey crew to wrap up here. And we're going to watch them try really hard. So I'm going to give you kind of a breakdown of what's going on. So, um, those of you who don't know, Russia invaded Ukraine over a year ago, and they've been in a pretty bad war. They've been in a shooting war with Ukraine for a while, but this they got escalated when Russia tried to invade. It's not gone super well for Russia. It hasn't gone great for Ukraine either, but it's, you know, it's back and forth. Um, and we've been funding a lot of the Ukraine and their weapons, and so is the European Union. Um, anyway, so... They're in this middle of this, this war. Well, when the war started, Biden was president. Biden um, instantly sanctioned, right, Russia and said, OK, we're going to sanction Russia from the markets. We're going to sanction the banks and we're going to sanction from uh, SWIFT, which was probably the biggest one. For those of you who don't know, SWIFT is the uh, international uh, trading platform for banks. OK, so if you're a bank, you can't trade daily without swift right this would literally be like somebody comes into an office building and cuts off your phones and emails and you've got to do everything by fax now if you can still get fax right so it shut them down the ruble collapsed the russian economy collapsed instantly like overnight people were fighting over flour within a week and sugar just basic stuff um so it got bad. 
And what happened was a lot of these other countries that are they're not directly aligned with us, so they're kind of have sketchy alliances with us, they started freaking out because they realized, I mean, not that we haven't done this before, but to this extent, we haven't done it. Um, and basically, it's because everything's pinned to the U.S. dollar, and it has been since World, after World War II. Um, and I'm not going to give you a big history lesson on the Brentwood and, and all that stuff, but it, that's just been the way it's been. So the reason is, is we also have the most stable economy and the largest economy in the world. So the U.S. dollar is very secure. You, the U.S. government always pays its bills on time for the most part. We, we know that they're pretty reliable, right? So the major countries aren't really, this doesn't, they don't care. Most of Europe doesn't care. Japan doesn't care. Canada doesn't care. South Korea doesn't care, et cetera. It's countries like Brazil and Argentina that this is, you know, a little bit of a danger to countries like Saudi Arabia, countries like Russia and China. So what happened is, is Brazil and Argentina and some of these other countries started saying, well, hey, you know, the problem is, is especially countries like that where we're so heavily dependent on oil. These countries are called the BRICS. It's uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and Saudi Arabia are the big five. Um, and they're all kind of in this and they realize we're so dependent on oil for our economy. And oil is completely tacked to the U.S. dollar. I mean, inescapably tacked. So what happens if we cross the U.S. and they sanction us? It'll be impossible for us to trade. Our economies will collapse. So what they're trying to do is let's broker deals where we can trade in our own currencies or we can trade in some uh, alternate currency. And so Russia and China have been talking about doing that, where Russia's talking about, well, we'll trade in the uh, renminbi, well, the yuan, I'll just call it the yuan. It's the same thing. We'll just trade in that. That way, if the U.S. sanctions us again, right, or whatnot, we have at least some security with the Chinese, with the yuan. Not a great solution because the yuan is not a stable currency. It yo-yos up and down quite a bit. On top of that fact, the yuan is very limited in where you can trade it. You can't really trade it in a lot of places outside of China. I mean, it's difficult to trade. And it's not like... a currency that sits on a, on any global market. So it's not like it's a great solution, but it's, I guess it's one thing more than nothing, right? But people on the right have been freaking out about, well, the Chinese are trying to undermine the US dollar by doing this deal with Russia. And it's like, no, they're doing it because frankly, the Chinese are trying to, to be more dependent on their own money. They're trying to get away from US debt, right? Because China wants to be a global financial power. And the other thing about it is, is it's just a good deal for them because Russia is now beholden to them. Yeah. But the Dave Ramsey show, George Skippy Camel and uh, Ken Fruity Doop Coleman are going to try and break this down and explain it to you. And guess what? They're not going to get it right. So. <laughs> So what you just explained to us, this is going to be their attempt. Yeah. Basically, it's the same thing as always. They half read an article and barely understood it. <laughs> so we're going to watch them real quick. And then... Everybody's freaking out about the latest round of negative news. I'm not freaked out. So the I know you are, but we'll tell people why. Okay. So the, the source here, and we want to just give a brief amount of perspective because the news exists to freak us out, scare us. They want pearl clutching, hand wringing. It makes for good ratings, George, and then they can sell those ads for a little bit more money. So the latest is freaking people out about our financial future, specifically the dollar. All right. So you've got, you know, Putin, uh, Vladimir, uh, Vladimir Putin, Mr. Russia over there. And you got Xi Jinping, who is the Chinese premier. And now they're hanging out. A three day summit. They're in cahoots, George. I don't like it. I don't like it either. And so you got Putin and Xi Jinping. So already some sound analysis. <laughs> the president. I feel like they're acting as though. These two countries having leaders hanging out is new. 
Yeah, they're both dictatorships. I mean, this is, this is just not new. Yeah, they not, I mean, they haven't been ultra close, but they've been fairly close for, God, since, what, the 40s? Right. You know? So. All right. I mean, I guess let's go on. Yeah. This is already stupid, but... But they're talking like, I mean, like they're talking like a five-year-old. So, Mr. Russia... I think I'd look cute in his shirt. Yeah. Mr. Russia and Mr. China are hanging out, and they're bad guys. And it's not good. <laughs> it's like the Joker hanging out with the Penguin. <laughs> Jing, hanging out. And they're talking about an alliance to threaten the U.S. dollar. And you want the direct quote from Putin on this? I, anytime we can hear... So here's the deal. It doesn't... They're not... So Putin, Putin would like to threaten the U.S. dollar. China would be okay with this undermining it, but they realize we're not threatening the U.S. dollar. Neither one of them have strong enough currencies. I mean, I think they could say that. They could, like, say those words or something like, oh. I threaten your dollar, right? But they don't have strong enough currencies for that to actually be a thing. Well, I could imagine Putin, I mean, his regime right now is so out there. They might be crazy enough to think they could do it, but... I think the Chinese government is smart enough to go, no, but if it undercuts the Americans a little bit, it doesn't hurt us. I mean, but I think that's all China thinks about it. Plus, China's thinking, we'll make some extra money off of it. So, because Russia will have to go through our currency. So, you know, we'll get to set interest. Hear from Putin, I like to hear from I'm him. I'm tempted to try my Russian accent, but I think I will offend all people groups in doing so. Well, if you die mysteriously refrain. this evening, we will know why. Okay, I so badly want to do it, I'm so Just nervous. Just do it! It's we, an entertainment show. We are in show. favor of using the Chinese Yuan for settlements between Russia and the countries of Asia, Africa, and Latin America. What are you? He's watched too many James Bond movies, but I will applaud for that. That's pretty, pretty, good. pretty good. So there's the quote. He's saying, uh, <laughs> no. basically... These two are like the worst substitute teachers in the world. <laughs> am, I, am I alone on that one? <laughs> uh, no, no. My kids would hang them out to dry. Oh, yeah. Oof. <laughs> I literally can't do they them in my switch class. They want to switch from the dollar. What was that? Hang on. Go ahead. No, that's it. I was just imagining them in my classroom and the train wreck I would come back to. Uh, oh, yeah. Destroyed. They might be tied up in it, man. I don't know. These are the two guys that would walk into the, the high school. This is the substitute teachers, and all the kids would be sitting there going, How long do you think it'll take us to make them cry? <laughs> if we can duct tape them to a desk, we'll come back for them later. It'd just be funny for now, right? <laughs> yep. Oh, man. Oh, sure. And move to the Chinese Yuan. Yeah. So, which could hurt. America, could. obviously. So you've got two schools of thought when you see news like this, right? You can go out on the internet and you can see a, a, a whole line of articles and opinions saying, this is really scary. They're going to collude. Now, first off, all these articles that are saying it's really scary are right-wing sites for the most part. You see it on the financial news is talking about it, but really matter-of-factly, and it's not a big story. And you don't hardly see this at all on any sort of left-wing kind of news and when i mean you're not going to see this on the mainstream news because it's a boring story with a boring end which is eh, nothing's really going to happen right so yeah so this whole yeah you're going to go out and see all these scary stories yeah but it's coming from your guys' side of the pond dude it's not coming from over here they're going to knock the dollar out and they're going to take all of our savings it's just going to be an absolute disaster and then on the other side you got just as many experts and economists and people going, you know what? If that were to happen, it would take a very, very long time. China can't do it. They won't do it because they own most of our debt, which that part is true. That is not true. So I want to get back to this because they're going to go into a little bit of the China fear mongering again. This is a fucking lie. China does not own a lot of our debt. China owns a very small portion of our debt. So right now, China holds about $870 billion in U.S. debt, okay? And they're offloading a lot of it right now because they don't want to hold as much anymore. Um, now, that's uh, we have $31 trillion in debt. So China owns 2.8% of the total. 
of U.S. debt. Three-fourths of all U.S. debt is held domestically in the United States. It's owned by Americans or it's owned within the government, right? So China doesn't own that much U.S. debt. We're not in, in any horrible beholdens to China. We could pay it off pretty easily if we needed to, right? Do you know who the largest holder, foreign holder of U.S. debt is? Japan. They own over 1.08 uh, trillion. And believe it or not, Japan is a super, super close ally. Japan doesn't even really have their own military. They use ours. That's how close of an ally. Strategy. <laughs> Yeah, let's not bother with all this. We can just, let's let them do it. Yeah. So I don't know what they're worried about. So this whole China owns a ton of our debt. That's bullshit. It's just bullshit. It's not true. But it is part of the fear mongering. China owns all this debt. China has all these people. China's taking our jobs, right? China's releasing pandemics, right? It's all this conspiracy fear mongering to try and gin up some sort of political movement against China. When in the end, nobody's going to do anything anyway. Because they, but we buy all their goods. But that's the problem is, is they're still stuck in this, that, that realm of Chinese fear mongering. So the point we're making here is we're not taking a position on one way or the other. And we're certainly not going to predict doomsday. Okay. What we are going to say is you can control certain things and you not having debt. Let's start there, George. Is a good thing. Okay, so I love Ken. I love him. So great. All right, George, this is getting too complicated. Can't we go back to yelling at poor people about their debt and blaming everything on the poor people? <laughs> I'm good at that. I can do that. I'm an economist, and I think they're ill yeah. to do You're talking about international flight. Can't I just go back to yelling at poor people and telling them they're stupid? <laughs> can I just do that? Can I go back to telling people that I'm a career expert, even though I have no background in it? Not my background that has anything to do with that. <laughs> but George, Skippy, oh no, George is one of those guys who skims an article and thinks he's a genius. So nope, he's gonna he's gonna ride this he's gonna ride this horse all the way down to hell. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. So let's talk about the consequences. If this ever were to happen, which, by the way, we've got an MSN piece here saying plans by Russia and China to challenge the dollar on the world stage are going nowhere. Experts say Russia's fragile economy and China's capital controls make both of their currencies less appealing. If that gives you any peace. Right. Now, let's talk about some of the consequences if the U.S. were to lose its world reserve currency status. So firstly, the value of the dollar would likely decrease, which oh, leads to... Time. Higher inflation. Nobody okay, wants that. So this is... So, let's start with his analysis. So, not going to happen. But if it does happen, <laughs> why are we talking about if it does happen? It's not going to happen. You just said it's not going to happen. I don't get it. If we lose our res world reserve status, under what circumstance? How? Well, I don't even know if he knows what that means. No. And I'm not blaming him, but, but he's now talking about it like he does know what, what that means. Well, what he's also assuming here, and whatever it is hypothetical he's doing, he has to assume there's something else that replaces it. What would that be? Are we saying, okay, all of a sudden right. the yuan becomes so stable that that becomes the reserve standard? Well, that would also mean China would have to open up. China doesn't even have a market. They don't have a secondary market. They don't have an exchange like the New York Stock Exchange. You can't trade stocks in China like that. China doesn't have an open trade policy with currency like that. You can't trade out their currency in world markets very easily unless you're doing it through secondary markets of somebody who's already purchased it. So China would have to change everything about their economy 
and their market economy. They'd have to create a stock market, which they don't have, and a commodities market, and an options market. They don't have any of those things. They have no secondary markets. So what you're talking about is all pie in the sky because for a dictatorship like that, they, I mean, they say they're communist. They're not communist. They're a dictatorship. For them to open up like that puts a lot of danger because it democratizes their economy. So it puts a lot of danger on the so-called communist party, which is really just a dictatorship because now all of a sudden they're beholden to the wealthy. Because they can't just let's see what he says real quick and then we'll we'll close this out. And even higher interest rates. Right. Now here's the interesting part. If you get out of debt and you no longer need to borrow money, interest rates don't affect you as much, do they? Right. right. Now, so that's why you're saying get out of debt. Okay, that's just stupid. Okay, we'll close it there. Even if you have no debt. Well, that's that cycling, that's that cycling back to let's just bring this back to uh yelling at poor people poor people about and he's, al he's also incorrect interest rates <laughs> if you're out of debt interest rates don't affect you well no not exactly because if you're going to purchase something or get new debt higher interest rates mean you're paying a higher interest when you when you get a debt it's locked in right if i buy a a car or a house, the interest rate I buy it at is what the interest rate is going forward. It doesn't matter how much the interest rates raise after that. That's the one I've locked in. That's what I'm contracted for. Right. But if I'm going to buy something new, then interest rates are going to affect me. It's also going to affect other prices like prices of goods. It's going to affect the ability of companies to get money and hire more people, raise wages, create new jobs. So this idea that, oh, interest rates don't affect you if you paid off your debt. Well, if you have debt, they don't really affect you because you're locked in in almost all of your debt. If you don't have debt, you're still in the same position of people with debt, which is interest rates are going to affect job creation. They're going to affect taking new loans, new business, and it just screws the entire market. So once again, they half read something, don't understand it. Then they start applying financial concepts they don't even understand. And they're doing this what if game when the what if is not even likely. I mean, you know, what if a comet hits the planet? Honestly, <laughs> they just they got in way over their heads with that one. No, I way know. Up. I know. It's like two kids trying to fake a book report. You know, and they only read the first couple chapters. It's like, great expectations. All I can tell you is Miss Haversham should throw that cake out because it's getting rotty. <laughs> and that's the book. <laughs> and they all ended happily ever after. <laughs> all right. Well, on that note. <laughs> Well, anyways, that's the whole connection. I mean, the that's the that's the big Republican thing is we're going to talk about wokeism in China and argue about these things. When really, what it comes down to is it's just a lot of normal course of business kind of shit going on. Companies are trying to make more money. China is trying to improve its financial position. Nothing interesting is happening other than capitalists being capitalists. But they're trying to make it into some sinister plot. Right. You know. So, anyway, where can everybody find you, Lacey? Well, you can find me at mysensebusinesssense.com. You can find information about upcoming uh, workshops, uh, coaching programs that I run. You can find articles that I've written. If you have any questions, comments about those, you can write in to us. Or if you want to maybe dial in, call, talk to us about something on the show. Yeah. If you want to offer suggestions or some clips you want us to review or topic requests, feel free to email us. Duncan, where can they do that? You can email us uh, down there at the link, uh, gossipfinancead at uh, outlook.com. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining, and we'll catch you next time.
please like and subscribe. Oh, yes, do that too.